Hello, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kaylin Ashcroft. Thanks for watching another video on our leaders covering the heads of state or in effect the leaders of all the major countries of the world. Today we will be doing two particularly important countries and individuals, them being Shinzo Abe of Japan, the Prime Minister of Japan, and Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India. So two very large countries and in effect large individuals in terms of influence and in terms of ability as well. So without further ado, we will begin with Shinzo Abe, mostly because the GDP of Japan is a bit larger than India, um, not because one is more important than the other, or alternatively, if you prefer, we could say in this case, it's alphabetical. But to put it into perspective, um, in terms of GDP, Japan's about the third biggest country in the world, and in GDP, India is about the fourth biggest country in the world. So yes, without further ado, we shall begin with Shinzo Abe. So Shinzo Abe is a Japanese politician. He is the current prime minister of Japan and he has served in this position since 2012. However, he also did serve in this position in between 2006 to 2007 for a brief stint. However, it ended due to him falling into illness. He is a cons considered a conservative liberal, hence his party, the LDP party, is a little bit more right-leaning. In fact, by many of his um, critics and even his, those who support him, he is generally considered to be one of the more nationalist leaders in not only Japan, but perhaps even in amongst the more developed nations as well. He served as chief cabinet secretary between 2005 to 2006 and uh, he is the longest serving prime minister in japanese history since the office of prime minister was created in in 1885 so a very very uh, long time so not only as i mentioned this is a very large country but he has also been in power for a very long time so he's a very important individual to study so before getting into his uh, politics, we'll start off with his early life. So he was born in Tokyo on September 21st of 1954. So he's currently turning 66 years old in um, September of this year, uh, tw this year being 2020. His family is of significant economic influence, however, uh, throughout Japan's pre-war, this being World War II history and wartime and even post-war history, um, his uh, both sides of his family were quite influential, particularly on the economic side. However, one of his uh, great-grandfathers, however, founded the, uh, part, um, the Democratic Party, so also politically quite influential. However, they also had their fair share of hardships as well, becoming being a more right-wing family, during some um, uh, persecution by the left. So his father, his grandfather was Nobusuke, Nobusuke Kishi on his mother's side, who was the de facto economic king of occupied China, uh, particularly the northern province of Manchukuo, which was a Japanese um, puppet state in northern China during the Japanese uh, occupation in World War II. Originally, he uh, additionally he also had um, much control or economic influence in Korea during war times as well. His grandfather is originally from Yamaguchi Prefecture, so in effect, uh, Shinzo Abe is considered to be an individual who comes from Yamaguchi Prefecture. It's in the southern part of Japan. It's the twenty seventh largest um, region in Japan. Uh, the capital and largest city is Yamaguchi City. However, Shinzo Abe's family traces its roots from Nagato, which is actually a very small town. You might even call it a, um, uh, even smaller than that at 34,882 people, which is very small considering the population of the country is 126.5 million. Tokyo itself has about 36 million people, which is obviously the uh, one of the largest, if not depending on how you measure it, probably the largest city in the world. But to put that into perspective, Tokyo alone has the same population as about all of Canada or all of the state of California. So nonetheless, his family traces its roots from a very small region, Nagato. Hence, that's probably why his ancestors sort of maybe uh, 
developed a bit more of a right-wing tendency as they sort of climbed from a very small village all the way up to be um, leader of a political party and de facto leader of uh, Japanese invaded China and Korea. His grandfather on his father's side was Kan Abe, and his father was Shintaro Abe. They Both his father and grandfather worked in a mall. However, I think they did, um, despite, uh, I'm not sure exactly what they were doing at a mall, but I think they managed to accumulate a decent amount of wealth through this means as to actually be able to marry into the Kishi family. Or perhaps it was just through, through love that's possible as well. His great-grandfather was a Viscount, um, Yoshima, Yoshimasa Oshima, um, and a general of the Imperial Army. So um, d they worked at a mall, but they actually had quite, in quite a bit of influence on the, it, from the military side. It's actually said that um, during the Pacific War portion of World War II, his, Shinzo Abe's father, Shintaro Abe, actually volunteered to become a kamikaze pilot. And he was actually doing training to do so. And uh, if you don't know what a kamikaze pilot are, they are ones who flew the plane, essentially suicide um, missions where they would fly the plane into battleships and whatnot. But the war actually ended before Shinzo Abe's father finished the training, so he he ended up uh, surviving. Um, out of all out of all employments in the war, I think a kamikaze is your a uh, hundred percent certainty that you will die. So that would have been uh, very different. I want, uh, we could think of hypotheticals here. If his father had finished his training or been a slightly younger, he probably would have finished his kamikaze training and in effect would have died in World War II and we'd never have Shinzo Abe, uh, his son as we speak, who was born in 1954 after the war. So that would have been a very different history. We'd probably have a different leader in its place, and you can only speculate as to what the world might look like with the third largest country in the world having a different leader at this time. So, But nonetheless, his father never went through, um, completed the training. His mother, Yoko Kishi, um, yeah, Nobusuke's, uh, Kishi's daughter, worked as a laborer in Nippon Industrial Company. Nippon actually means uh, Japan, so um, a very major industrial company, but essentially she was a laborer. But I think because her father was quite influential, as we'll see, Nabusuke will, um, I think she sort of had a little bit of a uh, um, more uh, advantageous treatment within the corporation and through her labors. He, his, uh, her father, Nobusuke, and Shinzo Abe's grandfather, worked also um, as a laborer in Nippon as well. So um, he also did his time working in some more laborious tasks. He also worked, um, and during this time, he served for uh, Nippon Japan Industries from 1957 to 1960. So he was still working when Shinzo Abe was three years old. He was still working as a laborer at three years old. So it's likely that Shinzo Abe actually saw his own grandfather climb uh, through the ranks of power. He also worked for uh, Tojo Industries in World War II. So he's quite a, um, a capitalist individual. So after, um, after Japan was invaded by the United States or the Allied powers, um, coming to the end of the war, the GHQ led by um, General Douglas MacArthur, a supreme commander for Allied powers um, during Japan's um, occupation. Uh, they became more anti-communist, and this was going into the Cold War times. So uh, Nobusuke Suke Kishi was actually um, uh, sent to prison, Suga Sugamo prison. However, um, the Allied powers, um, uh, in effect, um, General MacArthur allowed for him to be released. But it's just, it just goes to show, I guess, the main takeaway here is that his grandfather, Nobusuke, was a huge economic force during the war, and then through certain communist sentiments, he was um, he was imprisoned. However, as the war ended and anti-communist sentiments started growing through it, the Japan's um, uh, further integration with the United States and Allied powers, he was released. But um, the fact that he was put in prison must have uh, been evidence that he was a huge economic force and definitely more right-wing leaning. And after his release from Sugama pr prison, his grandfather, Nobusuke, established the Japan Democratic Party. 
So uh, in, in, we'll go to the first quote here, but in uh, Shinzo Abe's quote, um, book, fa very famous book, Toward a Beautiful Country, he says that some people used to point, and this is a quote if you're looking at the PowerPoint here, some people used to point to my grandfather as a class A war criminal suspect, and I felt strong repulsion. Because of that experience, I may have become emotionally attached to conservatism on the contrary. So it's very clear here that his political perspective came um, not only from his own experiences, but also from his own family. So um, his, his father's um, in, uh, persecution by the, the communists very much led him to more conservative or right-wing beliefs. In 1955, Shigeru Yoshida's Liberal Party um, was merged with uh, Shinzo Abe's grandfather uh, Nobusuke's Democratic Party, forming the um, uh, coalition called the LDP, or the Liberal Democratic Party. The Liberal Party plus the Democratic Party equals the Liberal, Liberal Democratic Party. But um, it is considered more right leaning and it at its formation this coalition was was uh, engaged because uh, to fight um, for anti anti leftist uh, beliefs so sort of the, to uh, fight against the, the the communists and obviously Shinzo Abe Nobusuku Suke um, Shinzo Abe's grandfather was obviously a leading force in this but nonetheless you can already see now that um, Shinzo Abe later became the president of this party, which his grandfather had in effect started and even started the more right wing beliefs. So it's almost like the party was, um, was you could say, even made for him or he was made for the party would make maybe even more accurate. So he attended Seike Elementary School. He attended Seike Junior High School. This is Shinzo Abe. He attended Seike Senior High School. And then he later studied public administration and government at Seike University. So he stayed with this uh, Seike private group of schools from elementary all the way to university, where he graduated at 23 years old in 1977 with a bachelor's in political science or um, uh, public administration. So this, I think this, this school is important to comment on because it's many people consider the top university in, um, in Japan to be University of Tokyo or Kyoto University or Nagoya University. However, this is a very small private school and it has history for close ties with the Mitsubishi group. That's why I've put the Mitsubishi logo on this. Actually, Shinzo Abe's brother is one of the uh, CEOs within one of the Mitsubishi subsidiaries. After the uh, what's called the Zaibatsu um, policies were abolished, the corporation sort of eased off its control and donations to these schools. But in effect, it's generally considered that the Mitsubishi Group still heavily finances this school and has really close ties, as we can see from uh, Shinzo Abe's older brother, an alumni going straight into the leadership of Mitsubishi. So I think one, although he didn't go to necessarily the top university, he went to probably even maybe in effect a more politically or um, corporate, in, in a corporate fashion, more intertwined university. So. The, uh, despite it not being too highly ranked, it's also very difficult to achieve admission into. So I think it's sort of a very elite, elite academy, one of the four major private schools in Tokyo. So I think there was obviously more of a political reason that he went there. Similarly, maybe he just wanted to stay into Tokyo, but I feel as though he, um, given his father, his grandfather's large influence in the Liberal Democratic Party, I feel as though he probably could have gone to almost any university he liked, but he went with this sort of um, uh, uh, special private school. So I think that's very important to note. And I'll, I'll, I'll discuss this a little bit more later about perhaps some of the elitism that's associated with him. He, after this, after he finished his um, bachelor's in at 23 years old, he moved to the U.S. to study at USC, University of Southern California, which is based in Los Angeles, where he studied public policy 
at the Seoul Price School. He, he studied there for three semesters. Um, for this, I think he want, basically wanted to get international experience and just further learn about public policy. The USC is, um, is, a, is a private university in the United States, so it's obviously not the cheapest alternative. He, but I think the main takeaway here is that he learned to speak English, which is important and reflected in his diplomacy, but also he does have international experience as well. In April of 1974, at 25 years old, he joined Kobe Steel, which is based in Kobe, which is famous for Kobe beef, which is um, by often by many considered to be the top um, beef in the world. But um, soon after, in 1982, he left the company to pursue his political career at 28 years old. As I've reflected in some of the other videos, uh, many um, great um, political theoricians such as Plato and uh, even Adolf Hitler advised that one enter politics at 30, but 28 years old I don't think is too too young. And nonetheless, he didn't achieve any great uh, or substantial um, uh, vocal positions before the age of 30 anyways. During this time, he served as an executive assistant to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, likely because he had studied public policy internationally. He served as a private secretary to the chairperson of the LDP General Council. So it's obvious that maybe um, sort of through nepotism, he, it was very easy for him to rise in the LDP party. He also became a private secretary to the LDP secretary general as well. So as a private secretary, what exactly was he doing? I think it's more, um, obviously he was, I have no doubt he is a hard worker and was doing a lot of great work, but I think these positions were essentially seasoning him for, um, for major leadership within the party. So after his father's death in 1991, when he was then, Shinzo Abe was then 37 years old. He was elected uh, to the first district of Yamaguchi Prefecture in 1993. So uh, a couple years after his father's death, he became uh, essentially a member of parliament or the lower house in Japan at 39 years old, as mentioned. And that's a good, I think that's even, um, that's a plenty sufficiently old age to be fully developed to run in politics. He, through this, he rose to be appointed to chief cabinet secretary by the prime minister at the time, Junichiro Koizumi, Koizumi. And he also eventually even replaced this individual, Koizumi, as LDP president in September of 26, 2006, when he was 52 years old. So three years, or 13 years later, after serving in the lower house, he became the leader of the LDP party, which his grandfather had co-founded. It's almost like the party was essentially just waiting for him to uh, take it. And even the previous pre prime minister chose him to be the um, secret uh, secret uh, cabinet secretary. So he was essentially just being seasoned, I feel, for this role. That year, during a special session, when he was only 50, 52 years old, by the national diet. So in Japan, it's called the national diet, which is create, composed of the lower house, also called the house of representatives, and the upper house, also known as the house of, of councillors, which are both actually elected. So the upper house and the lower house um, in perhaps the United States or in the United Kingdom, as they have in the United Kingdom, the uh, house of commons and the house of lords. Um, one is are more appointed and the other are elected representatives. In Japan, they're actually both elected and they run parallel. However, you have to run through the lower house to become prime minister. But during this uh, special, uh, na uh, special session, he became the youngest post-war prime minister. So he, uh, but however, um, the youngest post-war prime minister since World War II at only 52 years old, which is quite young. As I said, it's likely because there was um, 
the party was co-founded by his grandfather, which obviously um, helped immensely. Similarly, his brother was also pretty influential in the business world, and I think he had a lot of strong political relations just through his family and through also his education and his long period spent in politics because he entered politics at 28, and now he is at this point, um, yeah, at this point he's 52. So, however, he resigned shortly after in 2007, so um, uh, less than a full year later, um, supposedly due to health reasons. However, it also could be caused because the party had lost the upper house majority, and um, as well as the, the house of councillors in the election. So maybe he just, um, it was too much pressure and he thought to step down. Um, maybe it was his young age, or maybe he truly was sick and felt himself unfit to run. However, in 2012, he came back and won the September, um, which almost six years later, in an unexpected comeback, um, beating the former defense minister, Shigeru Ishiba, as LDP president and serving uh, prime minister for the second time, which in um, it had uh, is very very uncommon in Japanese history. Um, I believe it had never happened before in Japanese history for someone to run and re run. It was a landslide victory for the LDP party, and yet he is the first former prime minister to return to office. So he even has quotes himself saying it's um, how fortunate he was to be prime minister from 20, 2006 and then stepping down in 2007 and then to come back with a landslide victory in 2012. Um, I guess a, a parallel here could be seen. Um, there's a speech by Donald Trump recently where he says um, in uh, the, one of the leading causes for his own success was just sheer momentum. He alludes to one of his friends who was a great uh, individual in the real estate market, but after taking five years off, it's very, very hard to regain momentum. However, it's very impressive that Shinzo Abe managed to come back in 2012 so powerful. Um, yeah, he's the first prime minister to return to office since Shigeru Yoshida in 1948, so a very long time. And um, he also similarly since then has had similar landslide victories from 2014 in 2014 and as well in 2017, therefore making him today the longest serving prime minister in Japanese history. So that I think at this point we can also consider him a populist based on him uh, winning so frequently and so uh, for such a long period of time. He's considered a right-wing nationalist by not only his critics, but even those who support him. He's a member of Nippon Kaiji, which is a, a revision, which holds revisionist views of Japanese history. Um, namely, some of these views, um, well, firstly, they, they attribute themselves as monarchists, which is a more traditional uh, conservative belief. And they also wish to change some parts of the constitution namely article 9 um, that prevents japan from holding a standing army so he would like to see japan hold a standing army once more uh, i guess an interesting parallel here is that in um in studying united states history one of the key concerns and the key reasons for the american revolution was that they believed a standing army caused uh wrecked havoc in terms of um, uh, life of the citizens as um, a lack of alignment between the interests of the army and the people on the ground. However, uh, Shinzo Abe obviously does not believe this and he believes that Japan should have a standing army. Similar things, uh, more conservative beliefs that are common within the Nippon Kaiji are that uh, they deny government's involvement in the uh, sex uh, recruitment of, um, of, uh, of the, what were called the comfort women during World War II, where often they were, even uh, um, Koreans particularly, were recruited by supposedly the Japanese government to be sex slaves for the Japanese military. However, um, Shinzo Abe denies that the government had any involvement, and similar, uh, this is this belief is similarly held by many other individuals of the Nippon Kaiji and other right-wing uh, individuals. 
I believe that perhaps I do believe that the the Japanese government did have um, some influence in um, in uh, recruiting these women as sex slaves, but to what extent? Well, I think it, if it, the only alternative is that each it could have been um, generals perhaps were recruiting them, but in still in effect they were they were affected by the government. It could have been a corporation, but I see no evidence for that. So I do believe the Japanese government did have some responsibility in this. To what extent did it go through the, all the branches of the government? Was it coming completely from the top? Was it more lower level officials who caused for this recruitment of sex slaves? It's hard to say, but I think outward right denial is a little bit um, a little bit harsh, and it's been very much criticized by the uh, particularly the Koreans, but other aspects of the the, the global community. He's a, a hardliner with respect to North Korea. Uh, at one point, North Korea uh, and Kim Jong Il, as well as Kim Jong Un, um, had kidnapped some uh, uh, Japanese individuals. And on one occasion, when the th there was an agreement between Japan and North Korea that these individuals could visit Japan, but Japan refused to give them back, which is considered um, by some to be uh, going back on a promise that was made for um, between Japan and North Korea but the nationalist perspective was that he put the the Japanese individuals first and he was willing to break the promise with North Korea to save these Japanese prisoners so that would be the the, the nationalist perspective that could potentially justify um, his actions the question would be do you think what's more important the promise it made with another country or protecting its own citizens so the nationalist or the internationalist would be the, the two arguments there. He's, his presidency or prime ministership has been marked with what's called abenomics, where he pursues monetary easing. Um, monetary easing involves the essentially the, the, the buying back of, of government bonds, mostly or other financial instruments to um, increase the money supply in the economy, which supposedly is supposed to stimulate economic growth. He's also in favor of fiscal stimulus and also structural reforms. Um, I, mostly this is the response to uh, Japan's stagnated growth. I think obviously many people have very different stances on this, but I just think that Japan has had such incredible growth throughout history. They have a, a comparatively very small population and inc an incredibly large GDP. And I think that this is just something that um, to expect further extremely high growth rates is a little bit too optimistic, but I'm not discounting that his policies are good. I think that Japan needs to take action to try to maintain their growth rates or avoid declining growth rates um, or even negative growth rates. But um, I think it just needs to be mentioned that it they need to be um, reason have reasonable expectations as to what sort of growth figures they could achieve. Uh, in terms of their relationship internationally, with their relationship with China, they are actually pro Taiwan, so that's against the wishes of Japan. They they're pro um, the the autonomy or independence of Taiwan, whereas obviously China wants to maintain Taiwan as a part of the One China policy, as well as with Hong Kong. However, um, Shinzo Abe supports uh, Taiwan as uh, an independent nation. Also, they've had disputes over the Senkoku Islands, which are a disputed territory between China and Japan. Um, it's obvious that they ha that he would have a negative perspective of Japan China in this respect, as both want this land, and um, um, and I think it's for this reason it's it's beneficial that Shinzo Abe is uh, at least uh, strong in in pushing for what the Japanese people want. The nationalist perspective might be the better one in this respect. In terms of his relationship with India, which I think is particularly relevant here because I'm comparing him with um, Modi, there are few actual Asian allies that have not had disputes with Japan and India is one of them, so very strong relationship between the two countries. In 2007, he um, visited to try to form some form further bilateral uh, relations between the two countries. I think this is an effort to move away from its 
uh, relations with China, most notably as China is the most powerful nation in the East or in uh, Asia, as well as they, he initiated what's called a quadrilateral security uh, um, uh, agreement, which is a dialogue between Japan, US, Australia, and India. So I think this is essentially just trying to give Japan more control or more power and India in effect more power over the region. As you might notice, China is not included in this agreement, but nor are other nations such as Korea or, or that being South Korea, obviously not North Korea or Vietnam or Thailand or any of those other nations included. In terms of his personal life, as mentioned, he has an older brother, Hironobu Abe, who became president and CEO of the Mitsubishi Soji Packaging Corporation. So obviously, I think um, there is a big uh, affiliation between his alma mater, that being Seikei University and the Mitsubishi Group, and just his family and um, the corporations. Um, and I think that's uh, I think that might have something to do with some of the elitism that is associated with his name and his family. Whereas other individuals, uh, very intelligent individuals, often go to the more public universities, but would they have the same opportunities as becoming a CEO in Mitsubishi, the large, the, uh, one of the largest conglomerates in the world, or would they have the same access to becoming prime minister of Japan? Um, had they not gone to this private school and had um, uh, family members who were founders of a party? It's hard to say, so perhaps there are a lot more glass ceilings in Japan than one might expect in uh, other democratic countries. He, his younger brother as well is Nobuo Kishi, so he actually has a different last name, that of uh, uh, Shinzo Abe's mother's side and that of Nobusuke. And his little brother is a vice minister of foreign affairs. So obviously a bit more nepotism there as well. Did Shinzo Abe help him get this role? Uh, I would assume so, but also just the family name went a long way as well. He's married to a woman called Aki Matsuzaki, who is a socialite and former radio disc jockey. And they married at 19, in 1987 when uh, Shinzo Abe was 33 years old. So I, um, um, I, in Japan, people tend to get married later. So I think that's a pretty reasonable time to get married. But she's considered as um, more facetiously the domestic opposition party as she often contradicts the beliefs and uh, statements of Shinzo Abe. Her father... Um, Aiki's father is a president of Mori Nagin, uh, which is a chocolate manufacturer. So once again, from a more, uh, well, chocolate is not the most conservative industry, but, but obviously a successful um, business owner, which is inherently a bit more conservative and also a very um, wealthy individual. During Shinzo Abe's first period as prime minister between in 2006 to 2007, um, she actually tried to open an izakaya bar. However, um, Shinzo Abe, her mother-in-law, or Shinzo Abe's mother, convinced her to um, to close it. So um, uh, obviously, the uh, his I think the main takeaway here is that Shinzo Abe's mother is still a very influential force, able to uh, force things upon his wife, and um, her clout from her father being Nobusuke, um, still is quite powerful. They have no children, um, Shinzo Abe and his wife. They had an unsuccessful fertility treatment in their early marriage. So um, I, an unfortunate thing to note, but as we see, Shinzo Abe is quite a workaholic, and would he have been able to rise to the pinnacle of power in Japan had he had um, children is hard to say, but um, I think it's still unfortunate to note because evidently since they tried to go through fertility treatment, it's evident that he had, would have liked to have children. But nonetheless, it seems as though he's stayed uh, uh, rather faithful or perhaps it's perhaps even his side as well that the, the fertility issues are present. But nonetheless, they stay married and despite their small domestic uh, disagreements, they're, um, they're, quite, they're quite happily married. 
So here are the symbols and the, um, the statistics for Japan. Here is the flag of Japan. The population of Japan is 126.5 million, which is, which is big for an area of 377,915 kilometers squared. However, not too big. Um, as we said, Tokyo is about 36 million, so about a quarter of people live in the one major city. 126 0.5 million is about a little less uh, or a little more than a third in terms of population of the United States. However, their GDP is a whopping 4.71 trillion, um, which is a, a very large sum of money for a population of 126.5 million people. As for the symbols, this one up here in the top right is the symbol of the um, lower house in Japan. Here is the symbol, this one second from the top right, is the symbol of the president or the seal of the prime minister, pardon me, of Japan. This symbol here is the symbol of the, uh, the, the uh, Yamaguchi province, um, which he is from. Here is the, the symbol of the LDP, the Liberal Democratic Party, which his father, uh, a grandfather, Nobusuke, uh, co-founded. And here is a symbol of Mitsubishi, just because I think, not necessarily because he works for Mitsubishi, but his brother works for Mitsubishi. However, I think it's got close affiliations with his university, as well as his high schools and elementary schools. But also, I think it just stands for the, um, the corporations of Japan, which he is in favor of. And his main efforts are to improve the economic outlook for companies such as that. And I think that's, um, I think, one of the main marks of his prime ministership. Here are the quotes. I went through the first one. Here's the second one. I have experienced failures as a politician, and for that very reason, I am ready to give everything for Japan. So I think this is just indicative of his humility. He has obviously been very, very successful, but he's also had his fair share of hardships as well, both in his personal life and politically. And I think that's why uh, many people do trust him as someone who is fully dedicated to the country. He doesn't have um, his own, he's not focused necessarily on his own children. He's focused solely on the country. He had, um, he, he had to step down from prime ministership as um, due to his illness, which could be a sign of humility. And I think that's really what this quote here shows. In every country and region, there are practices and ways of living and culture that have been handed down from ancestors. Naturally, I feel that they should be respected, that these should be respected. So this is just most indicative of his, um, his conservative beliefs. One other thing to note was that um, there was a survey during one of his early aspects of leadership where they uh, he thought that the the... The demonstration dolls that were given in sexual education for children were too um, uh, too inappropriate for children. He's also at early occasions advocated for the separation of of physical education between boys and girls, as he sort of wants to decrease the sexual tension between them. But essentially, this quote: um, "There, are, in every country and region, there are practices and ways of living in culture that have to be handed down from our ancestors." is just a testament to his conservatism and his um, love for heritage. His party, the Nippon Kaigi, or the the group that he's associated with, is very much uh, they consider themselves monarchists, and they're very, uh, very, very much quite traditional. And I think that's another key aspect of his uh, government. And and I I would I would also conclude based on the Tolstoyan argument. In effect, the um, uh, indicative of the the beliefs of in prominent in Japan at, at this current time. So that is Shinzo Abe. We will talk a bit more about him in the comparison with Narendra Modi. But without further ado, let's start with Narendra Modi. So Narendra Modi is um, in 19, uh, was born in 1950, um, also in September. So I, I don't want to delve too much in the comparison, but they were born in the same birth month. Obviously, geographically, um, one country is colder than the other one is hotter. But I think I do believe that when one is born throughout the year does have to some extent some sort of influence on their um, their way of being. So that's just the first comparison that comes right off the bat here. Uh, he is the prime minister of 
India, um, the 14th and current Prime Minister of India. He is, uh, and he has served since 2014. Before this, he was Chief Minister of Gujarat, and he served in this position from 2001 to 2014. He's um, Gujarat, for just for some brief background information, is a western coastal province, the fifth largest state, and it has about 60 million people, so about the ninth largest um, also in terms of population. So not the biggest province, but as you'll see, it's had a little bit of political uprest, which could be um, very much uh, allows for the province or the state to be much more uh, significant than its, ge um, than its geographical size or population might indicate. He's a member of Ver uh, Veranasil, which is um, uh, uh, which is his current the current region that he represents, as in the Lok Sabha, or um, which is the the Parliament of India. Um, the region he serves is in northern India. It's divided into eighty provinces. The Uttar Pradesh province, which is a state in northern India. So he. Um, he, he has moved essentially his um, constituency from the west to the north. And I think that uh, should be, uh, all be important to reflect on soon. He is member of the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BGJP party, which is one of the two major political parties, in the other being the Indian National Congress, the INC. In fact, actually, the um, BJP, the party that Modi is a part of, uh, formerly actually hadn't fared as well against the INC, but perhaps due to Modi or just changing political environment, the BJP now holds the majority of the seats in the Lok Sabha or the parliament. He is a member of the Hindu Nationalist Volunteer Organization called the Rashtriya Swayam Svenak Sangha. Um, Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangha or the RSS, which is a, a very conservative-leaning uh, group, which many members of the BJP and even within the INC are members of, but um, it's considered quite nationalist and throughout history has faced some persecution as well. So that's very much a very key influence in his uh, life, as we'll soon see. He's the first prime minister outside the INC, the Inter Indian National Congress, the competing political party, to uh, w to win two consecutive terms, um, and with a full majority, and he's the second to complete a five years after Atal Bihari Vajpayee in two thousand four. So he's also similar to Abe, one of the largest, the longest serving, um, or has served for one of the longest periods of Indian governancy. So very influential there, but also marks a shift towards more right-wing and nationalist beliefs. In terms of his early life, as mentioned, he was born on the 17th of September, 1950, so a little bit before Abbey, but the same month, to a family of grocers in Vadnagar, Bombay State, which is now Gujarat, who he eventually became the, in effect, democratic leader of. Um, yeah, he would become the chief minor, minister of Gu Gujarat. Uh, Vadnagar is not the largest city in uh, Gujarat, however, it is larger. But he would soon move to Ahmedabad, uh, which is the which is the capital. He's the third of six children of Demodradas uh, uh, Muchod Modi, um, who lived from 1915 to 1984, as well or 1989. Pardon me. And his um, and his mother Hirobara Modi, who is still living today, and was born in 1925 years after his father. He belonged to um, Modi Gandhi um, uh, or Ganchi, which is a Teli, which is a which is a coal presser, um, uh, an oil presser class. But in terms of the um, the caste system, which is they say has been more or less uh, slowly been eradicated in India. He comes from a lower uh, class who are supposedly um, either economically or educationally or socially suppressed throughout history. It's called, it's 
other backward class is the or OBC was the categorization. He um, at 13 years old, he was betrothed um, as by force, uh, which was common in his caste, and he ultimately got married at the age of 18, but I'll, I'll allude to that a little bit more uh, very soon. Um, as a child, he helped his father sell tea at Vagnagar Railway Station, and later he ran a small tea stall with his brother near bus terminal. So obviously he's really worked some uh, difficult jobs in some of the the, um, the lowest income jobs coming from one of the lower class castes in India. I think, I guess, the maybe one takeaway here is that he spent a lot of time at um, points of travel, that being a railway station and a bus terminal. So maybe he got to see many different people coming and going, and maybe that inspired him ultimately to want to leave, which he soon does. He completed um, higher secondary education in Vadnagar in 19, uh, 1967 when he was 17 years old. His teachers noted that he was an average student. However, he was a keen debater with an interest in theater. So he's very um, um, much a, a public speaker, but also very uh, boisterous in terms of um, debates and often like to go head to head intellectually with people. It said both both his teachers and classmates that he had an early gift in rhetoric in debates. So um, he also preferred playing the larger than life characters in theatrical productions, which later influenced his political image. So very much like um, um, he enjoyed uh, studying or acting out the lives of heroes, which is common throughout many of the, the past great leaders and even leaders today, most notably perhaps through Plutarch's lives, which you should watch my other video series. He's very much like some of our other leaders. Boris Johnson considers himself to be associated with, um, um, uh, with great um, Plutarch leaders. Um, yeah, and I think that Modi considers himself to be one of the great individuals that he acted out in his plays. At eight years old, he discovered Rashtriya Srivanek Sang, uh, which is the RSS, which is a right-leaning volunteer. However, um, um, it's a very important and strong political force in India uh, still to this day. And he began attending the local shacks, which were training sessions. It's a very right-wing oriented organization, and through it he met one of the founders in his state, that being Lakshmarao Imadad. So, uh, Imadar, so pardon me, or also also referred to as Vakil Saheb, who is a founder of Gujarat, in the, the founder of RSS in Gujarat, so a very um, influential leader in this region, where actually the RSS is particularly powerful due to the growing sentiments in this region. He inducted Bodhi as a junior cadet and later took him on to be a political mentor after Modi evidenced his uh, political uh, predisposition and abilities. He married an individual named Jasho Deben Chimalal. Um, as a teenager, uh, they got engaged at 13 and married at 18. It was an arranged marriage by the family, which was traditional a traditional thing to do in his caste. However, soon after, he abandoned his obligations and left home um, to lead a separate, as they led separate lives and pretty much led separate lives throughout um, this, throughout, till this day. And for decades, it was actually, he kept it a secret because he needed to stay what's called Puritan in the RSS. Um, and it wasn't until 2014 that it was actually revealed that he was married uh, just before his elections, which he still uh, managed to win. But they never, um, they, even after he admitted that he was married in 2014, they still stayed very much estranged. So obviously they did not get along very well. But um, uh, Modi is very, very career oriented, very much like Shinzo Abe. And perhaps had he found um, a more romantic uh, match, maybe he never would have uh, been able to dedicate himself fully to politics. Or, but um, there's, um, we can only speculate there. After he graduated from high school in 1967, he essentially ran away from home and spent two years traveling across North and East India. So he actually came from the Western coast 
Um, he a little details are shared about what he did during those two years. I think he was essentially tr was trying to find himself. However, in interviews, he claimed that he visited the Hindu ashrams founded by Swami Vivekananda. Vivekananda, sorry, um, very famous individual, Vivekananda, who is the founder of uh, Vedanta and Yoga, and he introduced Vedanta and Yoga to the West. So, very famous individual. But the way it works are these ashrams were essentially like uh, like schools, and uh, uh, Narendra Modi wanted to join many of these schools. Particularly, he went to the math one first, but he was rejected from all of them. Um, so eventually, he had to return. Um, but um, he because he lacked the, the the educational background to join one of these individuals. But I think what's important to note here is that he has a love for Hindu culture, uh, specifically um, vendetta and yoga. But um, he is considered a um, uh, very much a Hindu nationalist and loves the the Hinduist culture, and very much even though. It rejected him so many times, he still maintains this till the, today. In 1969, he returned, as I said, two years later, um, to, to live and work with his uncle in a canteen in Gujarat State um, around a transport co corporation He um, in Ahmedabad, Ahmed, uh, which is the capital of Gujarat, which is um, actually very, very large uh, city. Uh, it's larger than Vadnagar, where he came from, and the largest city in Gujarat with 5.6 million people. So uh, by even global standards, a very, very big city. This At this time, he also renewed his relations with Imadar, his, from the RSS, the founder of the RSS in um, Gujarat, and who would soon become even further his mentor. Um, after the Indo-Pakistani War of 1971, he stopped working for uh, his uncle and, um, and joined the RSS full-time. He was 21 years old at this time. He started campaigning for the RSS um, during the, um, the Indo-Pakistani War. So Pakistan is about 95 to... Uh, ninety-eight percent Islam, and this is where one can start to see that he had, he does still today have very much um, anti-Islamic beliefs, and he started campaigning for the RSS um, in contradiction to the uh, Pakistani individuals during the war. Uh, just before the actual war out broke out, in a not he engaged in a non-violent protest against the Indian government in New Delhi and uh, he was imprisoned for this and that's one of the reasons why um, Inamdar, in um, in uh, the leader of the RSS in, um, in that state, chose him to be his mentor. Later actually in 2001 he co-authored the biography for Inamdar so obviously the respect was mutual. But also, I think it's important to note that he is a, he is a biographer as well. Uh, he also wrote a history of a biography of individuals in the RSS, which I think is uh, one of the main uh, parallels between all these leaders, is at least maybe not necessarily being a biographer, but a love of history of the past leaders. Um, I think it's very almost impossible for one to be a great leader today if they're uh, oblivious, oblivious of the, the great leaders in history. Because although technology has changed a lot, the, I think the rules of, of leadership are, have, have never really changed. They've just become perhaps maybe even more complex and therefore maybe even more the reason to study history as he did. In 1978, he received a BA in political science at the University of Delhi. Uh, so he was 28 years old, so a bit older to receive a degree. However, it was the uh, University of Delhi is considered one of the top universities in India. India actually has a very, very great higher educational system. Many um, the the lower levels of the educational system are being criticized, especially in poor areas. However, the university system is really quite uh, excellent. However, he studied at the School of Open Learning, which is um, for remote students and obviously easier to get into. It's one of the largest in uh, the Indian educational system, this school of open learning with 1.5 lakh. This is actually um, um, only 
just recently learned this. So in the, the Indian numbering system is quite different from the um, uh, from the, the numbering system I'm used to. Uh, in the West, it's got a, a lakh is equivalent to 100,000. So 1.5 lakh is 150,000. So there are 150,000 students in this open learning program. However, in India, they write one lakh is a million. So it would be written as 1.5 million um, in Indian um, numerical system or 1.5 lakh. However, it amounts to 150,000. Um, or uh, 10 to the 5 is how they write, write it. He gra and he graduated third class, which is on a percentage scale between 40 to 49%, but that doesn't mean a fail by this educational system. It's equivalent of a C in the U.S. And in 1983, at 33 years old, he received a master's in political science at Gujarat University, which is... Um, the, the university of the state in which he was born and he graduated first class at this point as an external distance learning student so um, obviously with an a average the top um the top grading scale but once again studying remotely which um, one might say is less competitive but i do not want to discount uh narendra modi's great ability uh, he still achieved um first class um uh, academic standing so his career, one could say, sort of officially began in 1975. This was also during his studies. Um, the Prime Minister Indira Gandhi declared a state of emergency and political opponents were jailed and opposition groups often banned. So his group, the RSS, was an opposition group as they, they, had, been prom they had been protesting in uh, Delhi, New Delhi, against the government. So he was forced to go into hiding. Later in 1985, but he, but this also uh, evidenced his um, his um, support for the RSS and willingness to stand by it, and his mentor as well. Um, and during this time, also he received um, was put into prison as well. But in 1985, the RSS, after his a loyalty that had lasted for a very long time, assigned him to the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, at 35 years old, which once again is a good age uh, to enter into politics. So the way the RSS works is they sort of, um, they develop these individuals with uh, right-wing or nationalist beliefs and then sort of distribute them throughout politics. So some got put on the BJP, but some also got put on the opposing side, the INC. In his case, he got put on the BJP, which perhaps could have been disadvantageous because historically the INC had been a little bit more successful, but nonetheless, he still managed to win uh, prime ministership and climb to the top of the BJP party. Uh, Keshu Banaj uh, Patel, who was the chief minister of Gujarat, um, received allegations of abuse of power and poor handling of the 2001 um, earthquake um, in Buj, um, and therefore was uh, they were considering him stepping down. The BJP party thought that um, they didn't want to antagonize one of their own individuals, so they thought maybe they bring in Modi to um, to work alongside. Uh, this individual Patel. Um, however, Modi had a very, very tough stance against him and continued to criticize his predecessor as uh, general secretary of the province. Um, or sorry, at this time he was general secretary of the of the BJP, but up to be the uh, minister, chief minister of Gujarat. So he refused to work alongside this individual. He he has this quote, and this is our first quote on the page. I'm going to be fully responsible for Gujarat or not at all. So he refused to cooperate and thus uh, his competitor forced to step down and he became the chief minister of Gujarat in 2001 at 51 years old. So um, a bit older, but I think for anyone who's younger than 51, never discount one's ability to make it in politics because it is um, perhaps one might consider a, an, older, an older individual's game. Um, not saying 51 is old, but it's that um, um, there's plenty of time to get started. He is criticized during this period, most notably for his handling of the Gujarat riots in 2002, which was one year after he came into power. These riots took place mostly in Ahmedabad, 
um, the capital of Gujarat. There were 1,044 dead uh, killed through this. However, 790 were Muslim and 254 were Hindu. So what these riots were, were essentially an attack by the Hindus on the Islamic population in the region. And Modi is criticized for his um, uh, for not condemning this or not even uh, intervening. However, the Supreme Court found no evidence against Modi personally. Um, one might say, first one could conclude maybe Modi truly was innocent, but I think the evidence has now shown that Modi is definitely um, a Hindu nationalist and has somewhat anti-Islamic um, sentiments. However, what this might actually um, allude to is that the Supreme Court is also um, has uh, Hindu, uh, pro-Hindu and anti-Islam sentiments. Despite this, in the Gujarat province, he's praised for the economic growth he achieved in the region as chief minister, but he's also criticized for failing to significantly improve health, poverty, and education. So the economy had grown a lot in Gujarat during his control of this um, of this state. However, um, very little actually of the most important things uh, for the people at the very bottom, health and poverty and education, had been addressed. But um, I don't think that is entirely... Um, Modi's fault. I mean, one could dispute, you know, how much, how, what really could be done. Um, at least he is, has increased the top line. But generally, um, by, amongst the Hindu population, he's very much supported. So uh, at least he is probably doing something right. Um, India is a very interesting country that um, the, the poorest people have some of the, the strongest rights relative to, to any other country. One cannot. Um, remove a homeless person if one wants to build a building, whereas other countries, perhaps um, we could compare it to China, if there's a homeless person, they'll literally run them over to build a building. So despite the immense poverty in India, the, um, the people who suffer from poverty actually do have a decent amount of power. But his, his, um, his period as chief minister of Gujarat is marked with not too substantial changes in terms of the indexes with respect to poverty, education, and health. In 2014, the BJP, uh, the Bharatiya Janata Party that um, Modi was associated with at the request of the RSS, selected Modi to be, become the prime minister candidate. But many individuals, actually, Modi was so populous that they said uh, individuals who would not normally vote for the BJP would vote for the BJP because of Modi. So Modi was a is a very, very popular individual. And for one of the first times in the BJP's history, they focused on advocating for Modi as an individual rather than the BJP party, which might mirror something more of a presidential system where the president, uh, you vote for the president, not for the party. So Modi is very much obviously a, um, a, a populist here. And that's most likely because of his... Um, his pro-Hindu and anti-Islam sentiments, which are really uh, moving the ticker. He won, um, he campaigned for his high Gujarat GDP growth rate, which he did achieve, and he also criticized throughout this period the INC's corruption, INC being the Indian National Congress, which is the opposing party. So he won a majority of the lower house of parliament in the Lok Sabha, which is the, the lower house of parliament, for the first time for any single party since 1984. So rarely had a party ever won a majority of seats. Um, so obviously, once again, indicating his populism. He aimed, his uh, prime ministership has been marked with aiming to raise foreign direct investment in the Indian economy. However, at the cost of uh, reducing spending on healthcare and social welfare programs. I think maybe, um, uh, obviously these are very key issues in India, but I think maybe he, his stance is more that uh, they've been ineffectual and the money could be used alternatively. I don't think he has a neglect for the poor. But once again, I think part of his maybe right wing, um, besides obviously his uh, pro-Hindu sentiments might come from the fact that he climbed from uh, one of the lowest castes all the way up to the pinnacle of power and maybe he um, maybe assumes that other individuals are will be equally as successful so therefore maybe he doesn't sympathize as much with the poor that could be one of the reasons uh, he um, 
he has centralized power within the government of India. He has abolished the planning commission, which in effect has given him more power. He engaged in the high profile sanitation campaign, which involved this cleaning of cities and streets, which is um, important in India. Just being a, in a warmer climate, there is a lot of uh, a lot of uh, pol um, sanitation issues in the country. He has uh, weakened and abolished some environmental and labor laws. So for these reasons, I think the reason why he has abolished some environmental and labor laws is to, um, it's mostly for economic reasons. Um, India will garner more investment by decreasing its labor laws. Um, one of the reasons why um, uh, a lot of the, the employment shifts between countries in um, Asia or particularly Southeast Asia is depending on how strict their labor laws. It's uh, inversely correlated as labor laws get more intense, uh, less employment comes because no one, uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but few corporations want to build a factory in a country where the labor laws are very favorable to the employees. So um, I think he's decreasing the labor laws to bring in investment, but also there's a, obviously a moral uh, issue there in that um, uh, you see see hurting the the lives of these uh, vulnerable people who have to take these difficult jobs as well as his decrease on the environment his stance in terms of environmental protection is mostly in, in effect to improve the economy of India um, there's a good presentation by um, Bill Gates where he says um, it's obviously uh, very nice for individuals in a first world country to criticize countries like um, India or China for their pollution, but it's um, it's it's unfair to tell uh, India that they cannot pollute, whereas uh, the United States has already um, ha has already gone through those um, lower rungs where a country like you, you can't completely obviously China the economics are different, but to to tell India to to, to switch completely to renewables before even developing all the infrastructure they need is is completely unfair because the energy costs of building all the infrastructure that are needed in India, some places don't even have fresh water, it's going to cost an immense amount of energy and it's very, um, I think, um, unfair for first world countries to tell India that they cannot use um, non-renewables to produce these. I think it's... Um, it's 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 unfortunate, but I don't think it's fully their responsibility. The the climate change, and I think that they they have a, they have a right to 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 get this catch up growth and to burn some uh, non renewables because they need that they need that energy. So uh, I think it's it's unfair for and I think it's an unfair um, a damnation by a lot of the first world countries and very disconnected for a lot of first world countries to say uh, to accuse uh, some countries like this. But nonetheless, it would be nice globally if the um, environmental laws were improved. And I think that can happen both um, through agreements between both the first world countries and uh, the less wealthy countries as well. In 2016, he engaged in the controversial demonetization of high denomination banknotes, where he replaced the 500 rupees, the old 500 rupees and 1,000 rupees with a new 500 rupees and a 2,000 um, rupees. So apparently he wanted to cut back on the black market uh, and terrorism. Supposedly these high denomination currencies were largely used by criminals. So he replaced them with a new one, but it received much criticism because a lot of individuals claim that this, um, this really hurt the economy as everyone had to exchange all their notes. In um, Here's an image uh, here. I don't want to jump to the images too quickly, but here's one of the 2000 rupee notes that he uh, issued. Part of his legacy, we can consider it. He revoked special status of Jama and Kashmir in 2019. So um, after, um, in 2019, he uh, was elected, therefore becoming one of the, f the first to serve a five year term after Atal Benari. But um, soon after, um, this is very recent, he revoked special status for Jama and Kashmir. So this is a region that um, is, has a high Islamic population that uh, many w would like to uh, leave as a part of Indi India and would like to seek autonomy. However, he reduced the autonomy in the region and in many cases cut off communication 
um, for the Islamic separatists. This has been praised by the Hindu population in um, in India, but many people in the global community, particularly uh, nations um, uh, Islamic uh, that are have a majority uh, Islamic um, uh, population, believe this to be quite uh, uh, morally unjust. Um, I think if a people truly do want to leave, I think they should be allowed to do so. And obviously, um, people should be allowed to believe what they, whatever they, they like. This um, His president, prime ministership has been marked with exclusionary social agenda. By that, it means the exclusion of those uh, in India who follow Islam. And he's been considered a right-wing nationalist. Um, similar to as Shinzo Abe has been characterized, um, particularly by the 2002 Gujarat riots as he was chief minister of Gujarat where he either helped facilitate it or, um, or did not uh, prevent it. But for many reasons I believe that exact um, pro-Hinduism is the very reason he holds the seat of power because I think um, India is moving very uh, much to the right. An interesting um, a dialogue I heard the other day, um, uh, Donald Trump was just visiting um, India and one of the, uh, there was an interview between one of the leading Indian intellectuals and American asked the, the, the intellectual, do you think that uh, Modi is following what uh, Donald Trump is doing? As we see, Donald Trump, um, for better or for worse, I do think he's got great, a lot of merit and I'll cover him in a video soon. Um, the question was, do you think Modi is following Donald Trump in in some ways um, allowing for uh, exclusion of certain peoples, namely in the United States, uh, particularly the uh, Latin Americans are, he's not outwardly um, uh, excluding them, but he's uh, perhaps allowing for the, the, the growth of anti-Latin American sentiment. And the interviewer asked him, do you think uh, Modi is taking notes from Donald Trump? And the interviewer laughed, ha ha ha, uh, Modi's been in power for much longer. I think it might be vice versa in that um, perhaps Donald Trump is learning from Modi. But I think both of them um, are, uh, once again, prescribing to the Tolstorian argument, are more the product of their nations than the ones actually pushing the nations towards these right-wing sentiments, I think. The reason they were they were both in democratic countries, the reason they both were elected was because they were what the people wanted. So um, that would be the main defense there. And that once again, the Tolstoyan argument, they are just, they fit the mold that is necessary. And I think the more democratic a nation is, the more you will see that. So in terms of his personal life, he, as mentioned, kept his marriage secret until um, because he needed to maintain a Puritan in the RSS um, until 2014. However, they never got back together. He is a vegetarian, and he does not drink, so a uh, very, um, very strict diet. Um, uh, Donald Trump does not drink, too. Uh, he's considered... Um, Modi is not an alcoholic, but he is a workaholic, so he works very hard. And despite being a great orator and a great debater and uh, skilled in the art of rhetoric, he is uh, quite introverted. Um, he's also very frugal. However, he's considered a fashion icon. Um, he is famous for his uh, half-sleeved um, kurta, which is a sh uh, type of shirt. And also additionally, on his visit to President Obama in the United States, he wore a famous suit with pinstripes with his own name repeatedly uh, listed in that. So he's considered a fashion icon in India. In 2012, in a Google Hangout, he was the first pri Indian prime minister to um, interact directly with the citizens in live chat. So that's a positive thing, obviously moving forward uh, technologically. Um, he's very favorable to IT. He has this quote, something like, uh, um, uh, IT um, is Indian technology, um, IT is intellectual, um, essentially, uh, I misquoted that quite horribly, but essentially he's very favorable to the technological industries, and he's very much promoted the, um, 
the amelioration and creation of more technological universities in India, which have done very well under his leadership. One can criticize how the uh, how the um, the education of youth has been handled. However, he's also considered on the critical side and energetic er and arrogant. However, none doubt that he is very charismatic, very much um, like all of these leaders have a love for uh, heroes. Um, I, I, I was I'm mentioning Boris Johnson before. Boris Johnson considers himself to be associated with Pericles. Um, Modi, if I were to associate him with a, uh, a life in Plutarch, I would also give him Pericles as well, because I think he's very much a nationalist, or more, sorry, a populist, and he represents, um, uh, he represents the, the wills of the the Hindu population, and particularly in the poor demographics, it's not necessarily the corporations that are supporting him, which was marked by Pericles' leadership. In 2008, similarly, he wrote a book called uh, Jito uh, Punj, which he writes biographies of the RSS leaders. Um, once again, I don't think all the leaders are necessarily biographies or lovers of history, but I do think they all at least admire those of the past. And I think that would, if, if I were to prescribe an education to become a leader, I think the number one thing to do would to be to study other leaders. They say you're an abstraction of the five people you spend the most time with. If you spend 20% of your time reading about great leaders, I think you'll become 20% like great leaders. Mix that with, I don't know, some great uh, intellectual leaders, and I think you have quite a recipe for success. He also wrote eight other books, which are mostly short stories for children. So he's also... Um, uh, one could consider him an artist, but also very um, nurturing to the children um, because he has no children himself, as we could see also with Shinzo Abe. He's one of the most controversial and divisive politicians, uh, not only in the world, but in all of Indian history. Um, in BJP in 2014 promoted him as a strong and masculine um, individual, able to make difficult decisions. So as we can see with other uh, generally, right-wing leaders tend to um, uh, emulate more masculine traits and ability to make decisions. And he is, uh, finally, and most importantly, a hardline Hindu Hinduvat uh, with philosophy, which is Hinduness, um, and he very much is uh, um, uh, in support of one culture over the other, and that being the majority. So. As for the symbols, here is the flag of India, population 1.353 billion. That's over. Um, that's almost. That's over 10 times the size of Japan. However, the GDP is only 2.719 trillion. So um, less than half the GDP, but 10 times the population, or all, um, a little more than half the GDP of Japan, but 10 over 10 times the population. So. Obviously, um, a little bit of a misalignment there. The t similarly, the, G the area of India is also almost 10 times the size of Japan. So you would expect with a population of over 10 times the size, um, an area of almost 10 times the size, you would expect the GDP to be 10 times the size. But in fact, it's about 40% or 30%. So, um, yeah. Here are the symbols. Um, here, the second one down is the symbol of the RSS. This one above is the symbol of the BJP party. Uh, this symbol here is the symbol. It's a, generally just a symbol of the Indian government, but in this case, based on the text below, this is the symbol of the parliament of India, the lower house. And down below here is the new uh, 2000 rupee note that he um, created to uh, address uh, terrorism and uh, crime. As for the quotes, um, hard work never brings fatigue, it brings satisfaction. I think um, that is very true and I think that's part of the the Buddhist philosophy as well, or not necessarily just Buddhism, similarly Jainism, is that um, hard work, sacrifice, and uh, suffering, a big common theme throughout, um, particularly if you saw my video on either Buddha or Mahavira is that sacrifice is hugely important. Um, common in Jainism was starvation and asceticism, even body mutilation. 
but uh, those are obviously extreme. But I think through pain and suffering, that's what brings one's ultimate satisfaction and internal happiness. So, and I think that's something he believes. He tried to actually. He wanted to become a um, uh, a we can consider a, a traditional uh, um, a philosopher of Hindu, um, particularly that of uh, the more modern yoga. But obviously, um, Modi is well familiar with the historical religions of India, that being Jainism and Buddhism. And I think that's partially where this belief comes from. We should remain student for a lifetime. You should be ready to learn, ready to yearn to learn from every moment in life. Um, so obviously, he's he didn't receive his BA or his master's until he was 33, which is obviously not old, but it's um, a little bit older. Than most individuals, he received his BA when he was 28 years old and his master's when he was 33 years old. So obviously he, he never gave up and he believed in the importance of education. He was rejected from all the ashrams of, um, of Swami Vivekananda. So he obviously did not give up and he did not hold spite against um, education as well. This country has not been made by politicians, kings or government. It has been made by farmers, laborers, our mothers and sisters and youth. So this is once again indicative of his populism and that his support, despite his um, his uh, decreasing of labor laws and decreasing of environmental protection, his support generally does come from the vast bulk of the Indian population, which a huge portion live under the poverty line. But once again, the majority, which is Hindu. But... Um, yeah. So in terms of the comparison um, between Shinzo Abe and uh, Narendra Modi, both of them, um, obviously, they were born in similar periods, 1950 and 1954, respectively. They were both born in September. They were both quite conservative and um, and also nationalist leaders. They're also both very populist. They both serve for some of the longest periods in, in, in their respective countries' histories, and they are, um, and I don't foresee that changing anytime soon. They, um, but I guess one of the main, uh, one of the main things is I had a discussion with a friend recently, and they said, oh, well, like populism, isn't that a bad thing? And I said, how could you think, how could you, like populism could be good or populism could be bad. You could be a, uh, a popular uh, conservative or you could be a popular liberal. You could be a, um, it could come from all sides of the political landscape. So with respect to this, despite both being uh, conservatives and right wing, Abe is more popular amongst the aristocracy or the wealthier class so the corporations really do support him. He's got a strong affiliation with Mitsubishi, um, which is obviously right wing. But Modi's support comes from more of the impoverished pe impoverished people. So um, it could come like populism can come from um, from either sides of the of the. I don't know, political land, uh, political field. However, it must be noted that despite Abe's support coming largely from the corporations, most individuals are employed by corporations, whereas in uh, India, most people are um, self-employed, rather. So, But once again, just because they're both right-wing doesn't mean that all that their support comes from similar things. If you were to switch them, for example, obviously the... Um, I don't think Shinzo Abe would do very well in um, India because um, they have a very much a Hindu um, uh, bias. But assume that Shinzo Abe was Hindu, he probably wouldn't uh, fare as well in India because he would be more... Um, well, obviously they both had a very big GDP focus, but I think he is more... Um, he would be more focused on the corporations and less focused on that of the uh, laborers and that associated with the race or religion question. Whereas if we were to bring Modi uh, to Japan, I think that um, his, his perhaps, uh, he perhaps wouldn't focus enough on the corporations. Or similarly, as we've seen in Japan, um, Shinzo Abe obviously came from 
a very important family, Nabasuke, and a very important university, uh, Modi would have likely hit a glass ceiling because Modi, and I think this might be one of the most important comparisons, is that Modi came from a very poor family that was recently subjected to the caste system, whereas Shinzo Abe came from a very powerful and influential family. So I think Modi would have hit a glass ceiling in, in, um, in Japan. However, perhaps Abe, if he had a similar stance, maybe um, a similar uh, parallel position in India, maybe would not have been able to climb to the top. One of the reasons why Modi climbed to the top is because he's perceived as a man of the people. He came from a lower class and rose all the way to the top. So very similar ultimate outcome. Both, um, both countries are moving more conservative and more right-wing, more nationalist. However, for very, very different reasons. So I think this is an excellent comparison of two of the greatest leaders um, in the world today and perhaps maybe even throughout history. So thank you so much. I hope you enjoy this video. I hope you uh, watch or listen to some of the ones I will be making in the future and as well some of the ones that I've made in the past. Thank you so much.